1991's Naked Lunch Review and Thoughts. I can think of at least two things wrong with that title. Yeah, I don't know. I can't do the Nelson Muntz voice anymore. I'm going to start telling, by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes, not a huge amount, and I will get into some serious topics. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by Lure Movies because of that it's not that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the source material so it sucks, whether you agree with those assessments or not, this is not that review. And the let's see. Yes, yeah, so I realize this video is long. I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review. Most likely the zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler. So you can mute and skip ahead and you see lower my index finger. As soon as I learn, as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie and the book, including discussing the ending. Now, the movie is rated R, and so is this video, so I may swear, but I won't be using, you know, the movie uses some slurs, and I will not be repeating any of those. And, yeah, it's not, there's not a, a lot of, like, F words and such in the movie, so I might not be swearing very much. I'm gonna try not to swear more in this video than they do in the movie. Now, let's see, the... Uh, let's see, there's at least one other... So... Um, let's see, yeah. I... I don't know exactly how many times I've watched this. I watched it a bunch of times in the late 90s and early 2000s when I was still a teenager, you know, trying to gradually come to understand it better. I only, I, I listened through the book, but only very recently. And yeah, uh, I, I, when I was a teenager, I was very fascinated with movies that I could appreciate, okay, there's there's artistry here, you know, this is this is not something that just, like, you know, th this, there was a lot of care put into this, and, and talent on display, and, you know, I don't completely understand it, but I want to, so I, I would watch it over and over, and, you know, I think even if I had only watched this movie once, this is the kind of thing that lives in your soul. You know, I, I've never really forgot. This is the first time I watched it in maybe 20 years. And I didn't really forget it. Like, I, I guess I... I, um... No, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I would really say that I forgot any of it. Uh, the, the... Yeah. You know, I, I understand it better, but but there's so many such interesting things that were, like, in, in this movie, even, even if you don't understand, that's always been how I felt about uh, tours like David Cronenberg, you know, even if I don't understand it, and I'm not saying, you know, you're not wrong if you don't, if that's not your experience. I get being frustrated with being confused by something. And and certainly it's also, you know, the thing with, with Cronenberg is, like, you don't know, you know, if you if you just, like, like, let's say, you know, if you pick up a James Cameron movie, okay, there's gonna be, like, big, you know, it's not always outright an action movie, though it usually is, but there's definitely gonna be action in it, you know, it's the... the you're going to have at least some feminist uh, themes, you know, and he handles them really well. You know, uh, there's there's going to be at least some jokes, you know. But David Cronenberg, like, I think I did pick this up expecting it to be, you know, let's see. The, the Cronenberg I had watched by then, I think, was almost definitely Scanners. And I think I knew about The Fly. I hadn't watched The Fly yet. 
And it's this thing of like, yeah, I, I probably did think it's going to be like Scanners or The Fly or something like that. And then it's this completely, like, some of his work is really inaccessible. And then he's also made, like, some, like, you know, even if you don't really dive into Scanners, which I'll admit, when I was a teenager watching it, I didn't really look deeper into it. I just thought, you know, oh, it's it's cool. It's a movie about people with, you know, psychic powers. So, you know, I, I'd like to think I understand a little better now, but, you know, yeah, some sometimes you, you, you know, it, it was just that there was a, a time when, you know, there were a lot of movies that didn't have, you know, I've always liked the kind of comic book video game thing where, you know, yeah, okay, maybe a lot of the protagonist, a lot of major characters are maybe not human, but humanoid, but you have, like, time travel and space travel and, you know, cloning, weird, weird kind of stuff, so, yeah, you know, that was probably the main reason I liked Scanners back then, but, yeah, you know, I... I bought it on sale. I I was like, yeah. I I watched it and I was like, okay, so this was not like Scanners much at all. And I yeah, I watched it over and over and and tried to and and I would watch it with a, a friend of mine at the time, and we would try to together, you know, yeah, piece together what what is this like what what even yeah. Now, yeah, um, I think. In order to not spoil, what I will say about the plot is it is about an exterminator who experiences, n you know, numerous weird things. Peter Weller's Bill Lee, and yes, that is a very similar name to, you know, and, and some people call him William. It is very similar to William S. Burroughs, who wrote the book. And let's see... I, I don't review a lot of, like, these kind of, let's go with inaccessible. I don't review that many inaccessible things. And if it wasn't Cronenberg, I'm not sure I would be doing a video on this either. But just, yeah, it, it just, I've never just felt, I've, I've never been truly unhappy that I've watched any of his movies. None of his movies, like, there are a couple of them that I really don't think are amazing, but, like, I still remember stuff. Like, some of them I've only watched once, and it was, like, yeah, more than 20 years ago. I could still tell you stuff about it today. You know, I still remember at least some things. That, you know, there's movies that I watch much more recently that I don't really remember that much about. So, let's talk about the writing. This the, the book was written by William S. Burroughs, R.I.P. And, let's see. You know what, before I actually, yeah, just real, real quick. So, full disclosure, I myself am not a member of the LGBTQ uh, community, community. I wouldn't mind if I were. And, you know, apparently, like... Over the years, there's a couple of gay men who apparently, like, found me very attractive. That doesn't bother me. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, as a man, I don't have to worry, you know, that, that the fact that some people find me very attractive doesn't mean that, you know, no one is taking my ideas seriously. You know, the, the, the take just did an excellent video about how, Emrat or Emily Ratat Ratajkowski, you know, has basically struggled to be taken seriously because people think of her as, you know, she's conventionally attractive and it's just, anyway. Um, but yeah, so I am coming into this from the outside. I acknowledge, you know, William S. Burroughs was apparently, I, I don't know if he was gay or bi, but he wasn't completely straight, apparently. He he struggled with homosexual thoughts at a time when that was, 
you know, th this is set in 1953, and at that time, you could get in a lot of trouble. I forget, was that back when you could still end up in prison? It's insane that that ever was the case, but yeah, you know, and the, the, um, yeah, um, but, yeah, just to, to clarify, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to not say something ridiculously, like, out of line for a, a straight man to be talking about a piece of media made in part by a, a gay man, and clearly, like, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, what's the word? You know, if you if you go through the the book, you know the the um, yeah he's he you know Burroughs himself really dives into the the kind of it's you know he yeah he explores the 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 um you know, the, the repressed homosexuality and there's some internalized homophobia. And let's see. So, yes. And other than Burroughs, this was written by David Cronenberg. And, yeah, you know, he, he wrote 18 movies and the... Let's see. Um... Oh, right, that's right, yeah, he put the list of his, hold on, he, he wrote 18, he directed 22, wait, no, 24, and, you know, so, so, yeah, he, he didn't write everything he directed, but everything, you know, oh, right, right, uh, actually, yeah, uh, two of the 18 credits are, he, he got, based on original characters created by credit for both Scanners 2 and 3, but he didn't write anything for them. Uh, but, but yeah, the other 16 are him having written something that he, you know, went on to direct. And, let's see, yeah, and, yeah, and he's been writing as long as he's been directing, ever since, yeah, since 1969. And yeah, so I am I'm only familiar with this. Um, this is the only Naked Lunch. They're the only William S. Burroughs piece that I'm, you know, personally familiar with. And let's see the. Um, and I also haven't. I I've. I haven't watched very many interviews with him, but yeah. This is a movie adapted from a William S. Burroughs novel, written and directed by David Cronenberg. It is not what could be referred to as accessible. And uh, yeah, an interview, um, yes, Peter, Peter Weller said, Burroughs was not accepted anywhere mainstream. He, it's very clear that the people making this, the, the actors, you know, not not only writer and director David Cronenberg, but they understood what this was. You know, the the um, what's the word? The um, yeah, they they understood what they were going for. It doesn't feel like you know this is a movie where you could very easily, if if some of the actors didn't really understand it you would end up with these very stilted, awkward line deliveries. And I'll acknowledge that some people do feel that that's what we ended up with. Because some of the like... This is a movie with very little dialogue, very few lines, that feel like they were just something that a person would come up with and say in the given situation. You know, the, there there are a couple. There are sometimes, but a lot of the lines, it doesn't really feel like you know. And and some of it is hallucination. This is not a secret. This is not a spoiler. The the main character, you know, William Lee himself says very early on, "I must be hallucinating." You know, it it basically seems like 
he I, I got the sense that he's hallucinated before and it's maybe been a while but he recognizes this has to be hallucination you know so yeah some sometimes you know like I've never personally hallucinated but when you um, read or listen to descriptions of hallucinations they will very frequently be not it, it's not really stuff that makes sense. It's just like it's it's sometimes like anxieties that that you know take form. You know, it's it's not stuff that really that that if you sat down and you know took a step back and looked at it, you know, it doesn't really make sense. You know, so so the yeah, and and the the right to to. To increase my my cred just a little bit, you know they talk about Kafka a little bit. I have read Kafka. That is and and just amazing. I I love. Okay, let's see what is it called in English again? Because I read it. I read a Danish translation. Um, I think it's called the process. I'll I'll real quick. The the trial. We all call it the trial in English in American, I guess. And just, yeah, you know, that, you have this, yeah, existential anxiety was one, and, and absurdity are among his, you know, and that's very much also the case here. Now, let's see, but, but, yeah, so, so the, yeah, you have actors delivering lines that they don't really represent what people a lot of the time, they don't represent what people would really say in the situation, or in any situation, perhaps. But they are, you know, it, it is something that someone could, you know, hallucinate. It is the kind of thing someone would think went on drugs, that kind of thing. You know, oh, that's, I should probably also say, I myself have never been on drugs. Um, but I don't judge the people who do even though there's a lot of media that, uh, you know, but I was raised to not th think less of people who who do drugs. And, and, you know, it's very clear, like, sometimes it can really help, it can make you much more creative. You know, I'm not sure that the book, which did really, you know, in, in, the, in one of the trailers, William S. Burroughs jokes that it found an audience, book burnings, and, you know, but, no, I mean, people are still talking about William S. Burroughs today. Like, he really made a difference. And I really don't think that Naked Lunch and, and his other writings, I, I would assume, having not read anything other than, than Naked Lunch itself, I sincerely doubt that they would be anything like that if he had not use drugs when, you know, writing. Now, right, personally, I don't agree with the banning books that discuss topics that are offensive unless they spread dangerous misinformation, like COVID misinformation, hatred, and the like. I've always thought it was interesting that the people who are frequently most eager to limit access to books that go into things that they themselves find offensive don't think that you need to censor, for example, the Bible, which literally describes rules for keeping slaves when slavery is a completely unacceptable practice today in the West. Well, it definitely should be. In fact, it seems more like they're worried about people getting ideas that they themselves disagree with than in making sure that unacceptable ideas in general are banned or censored away. Like, there are children who have been made to read the Bible, even though it contains these incredibly hideous, you know, hateful ideas. Now, so, like I mentioned, I, I, not everything Cronenberg is equally good, but I've never been, like, just felt like, okay, this was, you know, this wasn't worth making, this wasn't worth watching, about a movie that he has directed, you know the the which also covers the ones he's written. I do think probably the ones I find most fascinating. I'm not going to claim that it's always the best of them. I do think that when he 
I I do love when he sets a story in something that either is the real world, which, you know, it, it's been a while, but I will be doing a video on the... I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. Hold on, I'll have it momentarily. Um, Eastern Promises and A Dangerous Method, which I did watch recently. You know, they're, they're basically set in the real world. But I do really love when he creates something like this and... Uh, uh, hold on. Videodrome, you know, movies... Existence movies where clearly at least some of what we're seeing is not the real world. It can't be. It can't possibly be, you know. And and with these movies, Cronenberg, like Terry Gilliam, is incredible at creating these worlds that may resemble ours, but clearly there are at least some things that work extremely differently. And this is a movie where like. Almost everyone in this world basically just kind of accepts that things are... Like, you know, sometimes when you have movies where something is completely, you know, like, say, The Matrix, you know, you, you have uh, at least one major character noticing this is weird, and you, you know, you might have other characters, you know, they've been, they've, they've seen it before... This is a movie where, like, yeah, like, every so often, you know, at least one major character will, like, question something or something. But a lot of the time, they're kind of just going along and just, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. You don't always know how they'll react. Sometimes, sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're angry, sometimes they're just indifferent. But the, their reaction does not tend to mimic what we, you know, what we would expect a, a human being to. And, and it is, you know, it is a world of drugs and hallucinations and, like, just, yeah, it's, it's, you know, there, there's a, there's a, um, when, you know, in, in 1953, William S. Burroughs was part of the New York sort of, you know, they, yeah, there were a bunch of New Yorkers who were writing, I guess, were they all writing this kind of beat poetry kind of thing? And, you know, yeah, they were, they were doing drugs and, and, yeah, it's, it's, it kind of, the movie to some extent puts you in that world, which is also, like, it's, it is a very, very different, this, I, I don't think this is really the movie to watch if you just want to get an idea of what it looked like from the outside. It, this is not, like, a documentary that's going to help you understand. This is a movie that puts, you know, it, it picks you up, plops you right in the middle of this very, you know, this this world that is very different from what, you know, people who don't, you know, you know, I'm I'm much too young. I, I wasn't born in in 1953, so you know, it's it's very 50s. It's very New York. It's very beat, and it's drug fueled a, a lot of the time. I'm I'm not gonna claim, you know. Let's let me just say anything I say about drugs. It's you know. I'm trying to be neutral. I'm not, I don't judge anyone for, for drugs, you know. Like, basically, the only thing I have against, yeah, I don't have a problem with drugs. I dislike people who do drugs and then make sure that other, you know, yeah, make sure that they don't get punished, but other people do, you know, like Wall Street, people on coke you know, getting away with financial crimes while people are put in prison for possession of marijuana. You know, that's... Other than that, you know, if I say something that sounds judgmental, please assume that I'm misspeaking or, you know, didn't realize that that's seen as a negative. I don't think, you know... Yeah, I don't think anybody should be forced into drugs, but I don't think anybody should be forced into anything. So... You know, it's that's not a distinction 
specifically for drugs, you know, I don't think anybody should be forced to eat oatmeal if they don't want to. So, you know, just, yeah. Right, so some critic quotes. Also really enjoyed the strange, trippy story the film provides as David Cronenberg not only made a loose adaptation of the novel this is based on, but also in certain segments of the author's real life into the plot as well. And that is real. I really, really appreciate that. You know, it's it's much more interesting for that. And, you know, like, Cronenberg says in an interview that he's very bourgeois. He's he's not at all as, as radical as his movies might make him seem. He really, it, I don't get the sense that he's judging this very kind of out there behavior of, you know, doing a lot of drugs and the, there's a very casual, the, the kind of, ca the, the sexual, you know, is, is also very casually, like, people will, you know, in, you'll point to, oh, oh, you mean that couple, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, they, they have sex with, with, you know, they, they have casual sex with, with young men that, that come in, you know, you know, it's, it's just, and, and, you know, you don't have a character like, what? That's immoral. It's just, oh, okay, they're, okay, sure. You know, so, so, yeah. And, yeah, various critics say it's metatextual, textual. The movie is not adapting the book, it is depicting the writing of the book, a la the movie Adaptation, which is also recommended, you know, you, you, I mean, I, I don't, you're not going to hear me say, you know, tell you not to check out something that, oh, well, I'll have it momentarily, that Charlie Kaufman wrote, you know, I, I, yeah. You know, personally, I I prefer Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind to Adaptation, but yeah, they're they're both excellent. Now, and and I'm I don't think I'm the right person to really judge being John Malkovich because I I only watched it like once and I did not understand it. I appreciated the artistry, but I didn't understand it, so I'm not gonna try to say if it's better or worse than the others. Now, it's, it, it's described by Cronenberg as if he and Burroughs went into the telepod of the fly as two separate individuals and came out as one new creature. This is a heavy metaphoric creature, but very good. Someone seems to think the movie Naked Lunch is just based on the novel, but it is a fusion between almost every Burroughs novel and the concepts that Cronenberg always includes in his films. Burroughs has always been considered unfilmable. He is, after all, known for his cut-up technique, which basically involves physically cutting each page of your novel into four pieces and then randomly sticking them together again, which, you know, once you know that, it makes, a, you know, going through his work makes a lot more sense. People who are active in the LGBT community generally dislike the film as it smooths over much of Burroughs' homosexuality. I'm not sure why it was handled that, like that, because... You know, it came out after, and this is, uh, let's see, I think this is from Wikipedia. The treatment of homosexuality in mainstream American film did gradually improve during the 1970s, especially if the film was directed at a gay audience, i.e. a very natural thing, more cosmopolitan liberal audience, i.e. something for everyone, cabaret, and ode to Billy Joel. So I, yeah, I don't know, you know, some, some do say that Cronenberg is a homophobe. I am not qualified to examine that. I'll put a link in the description box of someone going into it. I don't know if Cronenberg maybe thought censors would hate it for the other provocative material. You know, I do realize many LGBTQ people would prefer for the homosexuality being the movie over the other provocative material, and I am not going to say that they're wrong. So, I, again, it's, it's not for me to say. I, I don't yeah but uh, Burroughs approved of the final script and let's see yeah you know uh, Burroughs himself liked very much what Cronenberg did there and so I, I do think you know that you know that's the ideal that's that's what you want to happen when you're making an adaptation and let's see, yeah, all Cronenberg films are about identity, and yeah, this one definitely no exception to that. And yeah, it is very much like 
you know, Will William Lee is being like he's he's basically trying to maneuver this this very strange world. You know, there. Uh, yeah, I should say there are aspects of the the world that he realizes, and it seems you know there's there's a couple of other people who realize, but it seems like a lot of people are not even aware of these things. So he's, you know, he does at one point say he's very lonely. You know, he 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 doesn't know who to trust. He doesn't know, you know, and that is, you know, when when you live in a in a country in a time when homosexuality is illegal and you feel like you know you you feel some urge to to you know yeah you know it must you you must that that does make people feel very lonely did i make it clear i hope i've made it clear by now i i don't judge any kind of lgbtq you know activities again you know don't think anybody should be forced to do it. I don't think anybody should be forced to be straight either, you know. And it's just, it's a, it's a really harmful myth that LGBTQ people are more likely to sexually assault or rape. That's just not true. It's simply not the case. If you just look at the numbers, you know, yeah, there's like, let's see, is there more than there's like there's one shooter who was apparently non-binary. And there's, I'm ah, uh, let's see, I've heard of at least one person who's like, I forget if they were trans or gay, but but you know, one of one of the letters, uh, you know, and apparently was uh, you know sexually assaulted or or maybe even raped people, but. You know, you can find way more examples of straight white men sexually assaulting and raping than LGBTQ people. So, you know, let's see the yeah. Let's see plot twists. It's not really hugely about that, but definitely there are some very interesting developments over the course of it. And let's get into the direction. So, yeah, again, David Cronenberg directed it. And I... Let's see... Yeah. Um, yes, I've, I've ranked worst to best, keeping in mind I love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. These are all of the Cronenberg movies that I have personally watched. At least once. The Brood, Dead Zone, Eastern Promises, Scanners, One, Spider, History of Violence, Danger Me Dangerous Method, Existence, Videodrome, The Fly, that's right, in my opinion, Fly Defeat Spider, not the other way around. I will update the list at the end of the review itself with wh where I tell you how this movie, you know, where this movie places, you know. Let's see. And, yeah, you know, basically every Cronenberg film that I've watched doesn't quite take place in the real. It, it's close in some of them, but it's not completely. And, let's see. Yeah, you know, Cronenberg doesn't want us to know if the, 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 the final outcome of the movie is happy or sad, if the characters are good or evil. He wants us to think about these things and make up our own minds about it. And Cronenberg thinks there's comedy in all of his movies and is happy with how funny he feels they are, which, yeah, I, I mean, there are some things in, in, I'm not going to claim that I recognize that much of his, his comedy, but, you know, yeah, but there's definitely some things in this that are funny. There are a lot of movies about drugs. I think a lot of the best ones make the viewer feel like they currently are on drugs. And that that is definitely something that this nails. Like, it really is. You know, like, the first time I watched it, I had no idea what to make of it. I, you know, having never done drugs and, and not knowing a lot about the effects of, of drugs at the time 
And I don't think I realized yet that some people felt bad about being, being gay. I realized that some people were gay, but I wasn't yet aware, uh, you know, yeah, what can I say? I've, I've been very fortunate and very, uh, what's the word? Um, yeah, in the, in, you know, ever since I was a child, where I live, homosexuality has just been accepted, you know, so. Now, David Cronenberg said in an interview that he didn't want it to be about the war on drugs, so he used some of the drugs that Burroughs invented and invented some of his own. Let's see. Right, and some more critic, yeah, Kafkaesque, like hallucination or dream, and I really do appreciate, there is a certain dream logic to it, like, it's not just, like, random, you know, if, like, sometimes when you see something that is supposed to make you fear drugs, made by people who clearly have no idea how drugs work, they'll just, like, throw in a bunch of the, you know, oh, like, what is that, reefer madness, where apparently... Like, hash makes you hyperactive and, like, makes you go out and kill people. And, and it's just, like, do you not know? Like, it, it feels like a child's understanding of what drugs are, you know? it's and, and, yeah, this movie, like, there is a certain logic to it. Like, you don't... It doesn't... It doesn't feel random. There is a kind of just... Yeah, there's, there's always... You know, and, and that is the thing of, like, I guess when you watch this movie, if it feels like it's just random, if it feels like there's no logic to it, you know, that that might be a sign that you are just not used to the world that they, that, that yeah, of, of William S. Burroughs when he, when he wrote it and, and such. Now, let's see, and yeah, another critic quote, some have described this film as pretentious. Believe me, it is not pretentious at all. In fact, it is a great representation of how the intoxicated mind functions. When people are on a heavy amount of drugs, especially LSD, methamphetamines, mushrooms, and other hallucinogens, reality does not disappear, it just takes on a new form. When a character in this film is on drugs, they experience that altered reality, and it really, they, amazing job. Imagine, say, Alien crossed with Solaris, and you have the tone and plot of Cronenberg's version of Naked Lunch. And, yeah, that is that is very, very true. There's definitely some... Yeah. And I, I would like to think that they're talking about the OG Solaris. I'm going to just very quickly find... I respect that the 2002 one was like, you know what, I'm sure they thought that they could do it justice, they just didn't. The, the, if, if you're going to watch A Solaris, and I hope you will, you should watch the 1972 original by Andrei Tarkovsky. Absolute masterpiece. I'm probably not going to do a video on it. It is way above my pay grade, but yeah. Incredibly interesting, intelligent movie. And and that one is also this, this you know, kind of lonely and, and trying to make... Try, trying to... Yeah, trying to figure out exactly what is going on and, and make it... Make it work for you, you know, you, you have, that movie also has different people reacting in different ways to this unreal kind of, uh, yeah. Now, let's see, the, yeah, the opening of the movie very, very quickly sets up that this is, you know, yeah, this is, this is taking place in a, in a very d different, um, yeah, I, I really don't want to give it away, though. Now, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. I think it's an absolutely perfect ending, and there's no deus ex machina or other convenient writing. And, yeah, so the... the as an adaptation, 
I recommend either reading or listening through the audiobook. You know, the, the audiobook is free here on YouTube, runs 6 hours and 20 minutes. Analyzing it is way above my pay grade. I will just describe it for people who want to be able to appreciate this movie more but don't want to read Burroughs. There's a lot of visceral description, which I don't I don't blame anyone for. Like it's 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 very difficult to get into and it's supposed to be. There's a lot of visceral description, a lot of things that are intentionally disgusting, reflection on heavy drug use, internalized homophobia, trying to hide being homosexual, paranoia relating to these things being taboo. Honestly, anyone who knows Burroughs' writing really can't have been surprised that this movie was confusing and disgusting. Obviously, you're allowed to be frustrated with those aspects, but you cannot claim that it is unlike the writings of Burroughs. And, you know, David Cronenberg is, you know, if you don't want to be just completely taken aback by a you know, movie of his you're watching, you know, see if it's an adaptation of, of a specific artist or what it's about or some kind of, you know, it's, you know, yeah, there's a, um, what's the word? Actually, yeah, I guess that covers. And and honestly, like, you know, there's a lot of of stuff that in in the book is is really messed up that doesn't appear anywhere in in the movie. And you know, ultimately, like, there's a lot of it that you just couldn't. You know, it's it's as it is. It it's rated R. You know, some in, in, yeah. Let's not let's not forget. It is possible to get your movie completely banned in America, or basically banned. You know, if, if what you put into it is just, like, if it's considered pornographic, it might end up with an X rating, at which point, like, very few theaters will show it, and, you know, it's not, it's not a ban, technically, but it is in effect, you know, actually, I guess maybe today there might be like, maybe you could get it on certain streaming services, but you know, when this was made, streaming was not a thing in 1991. If he put out, if, if David Cronenberg released a movie that was given an X rating by the MPAA, you know, very, very few people would be statistically speaking, would be able to watch it. And so, so yeah, a lot of stuff he just had to nix just without, uh, there's, there's a lot of the stuff that's in the book that's just impossible to put in a, a movie, especially live action. Honestly, I can't help but wonder if it might be interesting for someone to try to do animated because certainly Fritz the Cat has stuff that I, I'm not sure we get in the the, in in live action. But again, you know, represents a subculture, and there's some really extreme stuff there. I I wouldn't rule out that that might be, but I don't know if I, I don't know how many people are still interested in you know in the year 2023, in an adaptation of Naked Lunch when again. You know, it's it's there. It exists. We, you know, you can just go back to the source, and uh, you know, yeah, a lot of people will will prefer that. And I'm not here to say that that in any way is wrong. That brings us to the characters. So Peter Weller plays William Lee, and. Yeah, there's a critic quote here. Peter Weller gives a monotonous performance, like he's depressed or doesn't care, and it works really well. And it's absolutely true. And, you know, before you say, oh, that's easy. No, no, no. He really does modulate it, because there are times where he really is, like, uh, um, almost desperate, kind of, like, really de devastated. And then there are times where he... I, I'm not sure... Are there times where he's outright happy... Maybe, maybe not, but, you know, and there are times where he's scared, times where he's angry. He, he does modulate it, but it is, there's a, there's a blanket of depression covering it, you know. And I gotta say, I, a lot of these people I don't know, but Peter Weller, 
you know, the primary thing I know him from is the first two RoboCop movies. And that's also a place where he has to, some of the time, be very monotonous because he is a cyborg, you know. And he's joined by Ian Holm, R.I.P., who plays Tom Frost, who... I suppose, I don't want to give away exactly why, I'll just say, in Alien and in The Lord of the Rings, Ian Holm also does this kind of, he's not, what he's playing is not like a an emotion, like, he, uh, you know, some, some of the time it maybe seems like it's, is he on the spectrum, maybe, or something, you know, but, but not like, uh, um, you know, in, in some way neurodivergent, could, could, you know, and again, like, him saying, both of them, saying these lines, like, it really, just, it feels like they do feel what they're saying, even though a lot of the time, what they're saying like, it doesn't make any rational sense, you know, and it doesn't feel like something that you would come up with in that situation and just say, you know, so, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, um, and, and honestly, everyone in the cast does really well. I, I don't think I know Judy Davis, who plays Joan, Julian Sands playing Eve Cloquet, all right, Roy Scheider, R.I.P., plays Dr. Benway. I mean, I don't think I've seen it other than this. Um, he's in the first Jaws. He's in the 2004 Punisher movie. I don't think I've seen him in anything else. Monique Mercure, R.I.P., as Fadella. Absolutely amazing perform, like really arresting perform. You can't take your eyes off her. In in just yeah. Um, let's. See. See, and, and uh, Nicholas Campbell as Hank, Michael Zelnicker as Martin. I think those are the the his writing buddies. So they're also part of this. Uh, yeah, Robert A. Silverman as Hans, and I gotta say, I didn't realize how many. I only recently realized how many he he has appeared in in several of. Cronenberg's films, you know, other than this, he's in Existence, which might be the one I've watched the most of Cronenberg's movies. That was the one I found the easiest to get into. And, you know, yeah, I was, I was old enough to understand it when it came out, you might say. So that is, that, that's one of the ones I've most gravitated towards of, of the Cronenberg movies because it it really just 100% like it's just yeah um let's see yeah he's in scanners so at least 3 of the yeah Joseph Scorsiani RIP plays Kiki and also does a really great job um something that this definitely is a movie where the the people most explicitly homosexual are also the the sort of stereotype of male homosexuals at the time of this sort of the the soft voice and the, the um they often look not quite not quite frail but but there is a the the there's a feminine um there's, they have some feminine traits to, for example, their their face. They look more, the, you know, they're they're not these hyper masculine, you know, kind of, and and that actually, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to cast Peter Weller because he's sort of in between, like he, you know, his face, it's not quite feminine, but it's not like hyper man, you know, like if we're talking like hyper masculine face, like. Stallone or Schwarzenegger or something like that, you know, it's not quite that, but it's also not quite this this completely soft. So so it does his, you know, yeah, it feels like oh he might he might end up going gay, but yeah, let's see. And 
Peter Boretsky voices the creatures and does a really solid job. Yeah, ev everyone in this, everyone in the cast does a really, really great job. Yuval Daniel plays Hafid, John Friesen plays Hauser, Sean McCann, RIP, plays O'Brien. Let's see. Um, the the backup cast uh, doesn't have a whole lot of screen time, but Judy Davis, Ian Holm, and Roy Scheider make the movie better with their performances. To pull of Cronenberg's films, he made sure this movie was a character piece along with a hallucinatory piece of sci-fi weirdness. Very true. And honestly, I think everyone, like, I had forgotten that Robert A. Silverman was the, the same actor, but I never forgot his character. You know, so just... Yeah, um, and and that's also yeah. I, sh I should say, scanners and this. You know, I I didn't watch. Let's see. Yeah, actually, I must have realized before that Robert A. Silverman was in multiple, and just forgot. But yeah, you know, Existence. I watched. You know, where, yeah, let's see. I I did a review of it. I don't know, ten years ago maybe or something. So I watched it for that, and have watched a few times in the years in between, and I have watched it again recently also. Now, that brings us to... Um, yes, cinematography. Now, the this was DP'd by Peter Sushitsky who has at least 44 credits as DP, and he's done several other uh, Cronenberg movies. Uh, you know, Cronenberg is one of those uh, directors who likes to work with a lot of the same people multiple times. So, uh, yeah, real, real quick. So, Maps to the Stars, Cosmopolis, Dangerous Method, Eastern Promises, History of Violence, Spider, Existence, Crash, M. Butterfly, this of course, Dead Ringers, and that might be, yeah, so what's that, nine total or something, so, so yeah, he's, he's done, they've, they've done a bunch of, of movies together, and you can see why, you know, Sashitsky completely understands what it is Cronenberg wants out of it, and, yeah, like, some of the time, there are some really kind of extreme things that are presented as average in, in this. You know, the, the, there will be, like, something strange in a, in a public place, and William Lee is the only person who really reacts like, what's that? Like, everybody else is just, what, that's yesterday's news, like, and... Yeah, the the um, and and then other times it is extreme, it it is presented as being as extreme as it appears to the audience, you know, and yeah, very very yeah, excellent work. Ronald Sanders edited it. He has at least thirty three credits, and he edited a bunch of other, um, yeah. A bunch of other Cronenberg and yeah there's this very interesting aspect of the editing that I quite appreciate where like characters will suddenly say oh that oh yeah that was that was weeks ago and you're sitting there like I thought it had just been a few days you know but no the the just so so and and that is you know like if you do a lot of drugs you lose track of time and or that that can happen at least now yeah so this this is estimated to have cost the, the budget was 16 million dollars and the yeah the box office was 2.6 so you know, and that's like Cronenberg has made a number of movies that were expensive because you know there's there's creature design, there's some location shooting and and like set design and and such that's expensive, 
And yeah, um, a lot of them, you know, cost a lot and lost money. And I'm really glad he's been able to keep making movies. You know, some some directors can't survive a single flop or a bomb. Now, this was apparently just filmed in Toronto. But yeah, um, they do really make like it has this sort of um, yeah, it's not it's not a spoiler to say, you know, it seems like it's is it a spoiler to s I'll just say that there's this very there's a, a Middle Eastern flavor to some of the the places and yeah I mean I guess they did just it was just sets in in studio which is undoubtedly like you know Cronenberg likes to have a lot of control over so it makes more sense to to do that than try to go to a place that looks like that and then trying to do his you know druggy weirdness and trying to okay that with the the you know yeah so so and and that is also like it's it, you can't really claim that there's nothing racist in the movie it's just i don't think it's it's not trying to make the audience racist it's not reflecting the racism of the people making it more the the that that was the idea again like if you you know if you in 1953 ask someone middle east you know yeah their their description of it would be pretty racist you know so it is just accurate and i appreciate that and i you know, I, I honestly, I don't think I would be able to watch Cronenberg if I thought that he actually was a racist. So, yeah. But the, just, yeah, it, it's, they did an incredible job. Like, I, I really respect the, the set design and the, let's see, the, yeah, set design, costuming, and prop department, just, they, they, you know they are the unsung heroes of a number of Cronenberg's movies because they really do an amazing job. Now the music was handled by Ornette Coleman, R.I.P. and Howard Shore. And yeah, um, Howard Shore did some other Cronenberg movies also. Now Ornette Coleman was. She she did not do that many movies. She has five credits. Wow. Um, spanning 55 years. Wait, is that 40, 45 years? And let's see. I think is she may be the one who did the... Let's see. Yeah, yeah. She's the jazz musician for, for this. And uh, yeah, uh, there's 48 and a half minutes worth of of the soundtrack uh, for free here on YouTube to listen to. I listened to it before rewatching and yeah, it's it's worth listening to. And let's see the um, yeah, so uh, from Wikipedia, the film score is composed by Cronenberg's staple composer Howard Shore and features free jazz musician Ornette Coleman, the music of the master musicians of Jejuka, led by Bashir Attar, is also featured throughout the film. Use of Coleman's composition, Midnight Sunrise, recorded for his Dancing in Your Head album, is relevant, as author William S. Burroughs was present during the 1973 recording session. Very cool. And, yeah, you know, it, it is, like, jazz is almost the only kind of music that would completely fit this, because, again, it has this free kind of... Uh, free association, I guess, you know. And the sound design is excellent. Like, there's some there's some creatures in this that, like, if they didn't have that very kind of... The, the sound design regarding them really does feel like this is actually something that exists when really, you know, there was a, there was a practical puppet on set, yes, but it did not make these kinds of noises. These, the noises that it was given in post-production, 
make it feel like it was a living thing rather than just, you know, probably mostly animatronic. I'm not sure there was much other puppeteering, but amazing animatronics. Like, you know, by 1991, that was really, that had really come into, you know, yeah, very, very impressive. You know, this this was the same year as the the second Terminator movie, you know, so th now this doesn't feel like, this doesn't, this movie doesn't feature killer robots, but it does feature killer animatronics. And... Let's see. Right, so pacing, like, let's see, this was, yeah, some, there were two negative, I, th I think this were, these were both user reviews, but yeah, one person said it takes too long to get going, by the time it did I was zoned out, and another person said too long, the middle is too slow and samey, I understand it. Um, I do disagree with that, or disagree. It was that was their experience, not mine. My experience. I've always thought this movie is simply too fascinating to find it boring. I, I acknowledge that it is, you know. So yeah, one of one of them said it takes too long to get going. I, I think that is, um, you know, if you've if you're watching this video right now and you don't you haven't watched the movie yeah there's some chance you might feel that way it does like the the overall plot does start early but it kind of it's not the kind of movie where there's like constantly new i suppose you could say like it's essentially a sort of investigation you know, and, and that's the kind of thing, like, you know, either you're, like, hooked and you got to see what, how, where does it go next, or you're like, okay, can we please, what, can we reach the conclusion, please? You know, and I think that is what some people felt. I would argue it's always, like, there's always something that, I, I don't think that the movie just... That, that nothing really happens, you know, I've, I've seen movies where, like, nothing really happens, and I, I wouldn't really say that this is one of them, but I will say, ultimately, it's probably more about exploration of themes, and sort of creating this dreamlike world, and maintaining that, than a straight plot, which, again, makes a lot of sense for this kind of dream that, you know, sure, there are some dreams where it's like, okay, it's, you know, very focused, but a lot of dreams are just kind of going off in, you know, I, I don't know, what what is it, you know, so, yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly disagree that it's boring, but I can understand, you know, so, some people have felt that, some people will feel that. Now, the movie, the the length, I uh, have it right here, so let's see, it's, yeah, so the movie, with end credits, it's an hour, fifty and a half minutes, and if you don't count the end credits, it is an hour, and 47 minutes and I would definitely say like if it was 15 minutes longer I think I would be like okay that's enough that's you know I'm, I'm getting exhausted I'm not saying that it would necessarily be a bad movie for everyone but I I think I would personally find that it but honestly there were a couple of things in this that I, I was I had completely forgotten how early in the film they actually happened. Like, I thought, I remembered that they're there, but I, I thought that they were, like, right by the end, and instead, much, much earlier, but, yeah. Now, yes, so the, 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 um, this is where I'm, where I talk about the best element, 
and yeah, the the way that it creates this dream, like you know, everything in this feels like this dream, and it feels like you know. Sometimes when you have a movie where a character hallucinates, you'll have the thing of like, okay, this is clearly real. Oh, this that's when they, you know, maybe they took drugs, maybe they were drugged. But now it's hallucination, and then you know there are a couple, of, there there are a couple of things in this where it's like, okay, that's probably the reality. That that's when the hallucination is no longer, you know. But by and large, what we see is hallucin, you know, it, there is very likely hallucination, and it doesn't really like it doesn't, you know, it it sort of eases into okay now you know like after a while you're like that's hallucination that has to be hallucination but there wasn't like it wasn't like someone fell asleep and now we're seeing hallucination or they were drugged or that kind of thing and um i don't know if i really have something I, yeah i i no i i don't really have anything for like i i don't particularly have anything negative to say about it. Now, something I did see other people criticize was some people said it was much too weird, and it definitely, like, if if when you hear the name David Cronenberg, if what you think is Scanners and The Fly, then this might not be a, a good movie to, you know, like, it was for myself when I first watched it, you know. The, the... Yeah. Like this, this is not. This is some of his least mainstream of of Cronenberg's. So it definitely is. You know, if it, it's for people who know that world, for people who want to know it from an inside perspective, and for people who just like watching th th things that are well made and fascinating. I'm not going to claim that. The things that are, um, what's the word? You know, sometimes movies that aren't well made can be fascinating. Now, let's see. So, I think, yeah. So the the trailers. Yeah, overall, probably give at least a little too much away. Um, I wouldn't really say that the trailers give you not much of an idea of what the movie's like. I, I guess the, there's like a modern trailer. That one does an okay job. The cover and poster do not give too much away. And they give you a sense of the weirdness, but not really what the movie is like. I, I think this is almost impossible to... I guess if you had a short film, but you can't really... You can't accurately represent what this movie the weirdness of this movie in a trailer or a poster. <clears throat> now, on here on YouTube, I found five clips, two trailers, including a fan one, two TV spots, including fan ones, three music videos, including fan ones, six review analysis, one documentary, and let's see. Yeah, so on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 70% from critics, and actually 77 from audiences. This is one of those cases where it might have been too a little too weird for critics and it found an audience you know especially today when like you know now you can express a lot of weird ideas or uh, yeah. I'm not saying weird is bad I'm saying weird not mainstream is what I'm saying you know you can express a lot of those ideas on the internet so to, uh, yeah frankly there might be some people who think this this movie is too mainstream, and I completely respect that point of view. There are 37 critic reviews, and 26 of them are fresh. And the 77% audience score is based on over 25,000 ratings. And the critics' consensus is strange, maddening, and at times incomprehensible. Naked Lunch is nonetheless an engrossing experience. That's, yeah. The average critic rating 7.00 out of 10. The average user rating is 3.9 out of 5. So, yeah, the movie is fresh. And on Metacritic, it has 16 critic reviews 
and a score of 67, a user score of 6.5 based on 45 ratings. On IMDb, it has 181 user reviews total and 148 without spoilers. So, yeah, I read them all. Normally, I just read the top voted 100, but when there's that few and you know, to some extent, it does also say, you know, it has way more votes. It has 52,241 IMDb user votes. It's the kind of movie that a lot of people are going to have a reaction to that they can't necessarily put into words. They can, like, grade it on a scale of 1 to 10, but they can't necessarily write something that just, yeah. Now, yeah, of the the... There are, let's see, yeah, so 12 people voted 1 out of 10, uh, hold on, of the user reviews, 12 of the user reviews, the, the reviewer gave it a 1 out of 10, 2 gave it 2 out of 10, 6 gave it 3 out of 10, 5 gave it 4 out of 10, 7 gave it 5 out of 10, 10 gave it 6 out of 10, 21 gave it 7, 9 gave it 8, 12 gave it 9, and 14 gave it 10, so... Overall, more people really, really liked or even loved it, but there's still some, there's a significant chunk that really, really, absolutely, yeah. Now, wait, is that right? Did I not? Huh. Uh, I will momentarily, I think I just, yeah, yeah. Um, so, there, yeah, um, there are 129 links in the IMDb external reviews section, 65 of them both worked and were in English. And it has a 6.9 out of 10 on IMDb, which does, you know, it's it's not a perfect, you know, it's it's very difficult to get the, the writing of William S. Burroughs or a sort of autobiography, which it, in some ways it is, you know, to, to really, like, it doesn't resonate with everyone who loves Burroughs. Now, let's see, so the, yeah, 25.2% gave it 7, 226 gave it 8, 114 gave it 9, 10.6 gave it 10, 6.7 gave it 5, 3.6 gave it 4, 2.0 gave it 3, 2.2 gave it 1, 1.4 gave it 2. I wish that it was one of those things, like, I I can imagine a number of the people who gave it 1, like, some of them are just offended by it featuring homosexuality, and some of them are you know, frustrated that the, that the movie didn't resonate with them, you know, I'm, I'm not saying there's no good reason, I'm sure there are good reasons to give it a really low rating, but like I said, you know, and, and yeah, honestly, you know what, I think there is some chance that some of the very low votes are by LGBTQ people who watched it and said, this movie hates my existence, and I, you know, yeah, I empathize. I, I, you know, I don't, I, I hate for, you know, I, yeah, I've always despised hatred. I, I think it, you know, and, and certainly, you know what, if you're watching this video right now, and you're someone who just, you know, yeah, you, you hate certain people, maybe it's not even LGBTQ people, but you hate a certain group of people, do you actually know any in person? Have you tried just meeting them and talking to them and just, you know, treating them like a normal person and, and see if you... Because I find that that's very often the case when someone just hates members of a minority. You know, it's... Yeah. Now... But, but yeah, you know, for sure, like, if you are an LGBTQ person and, you know, you feel like this movie hates you, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to claim that, the, you know, that, that's, you know, 
what I will say. That's 100% valid. I, you know, like I've been, I've been mistaken for being gay. So I have experienced a little homophobia, but not like, you know, I've, I've never thought that I was gay or, or trans. So I've never, you know, it, it felt like just collateral damage more than like a targeted you know they weren't they weren't really trying to they weren't hating who i was they were hating something that they thought i was and that's just you know it's it's not the same but but yeah um you know you have my full empathy if you if you feel like this movie you know hates you or or hates people you care about and and you know once again there'll be there will be a link in the description box to uh, an, an essay discussing that so let's see the um, yeah um just real quick i want to say you know when i first watched this i was a teenager i didn't understand the movie but it did make me feel things, it made me care, it made me appreciate a perspective I wasn't used to seeing. I watched it because I was familiar with the director, and I see a lot of negative reviews expect something specific based on the director and leave negative reviews, not because it was bad, but because they were unhappy with what they got, which, you know, I, I get, you know, it's frustrating. I, I don't like when people review a piece of creative expression in the same way that they would, like, you know what, I get, let's say that you go to, um, let's say you go and you buy a hot dog from a vendor, and you say, please don't put any mustard on it, you know, I, I have a negative reaction to mustard, and you take a bite and you realize he did put mustard in it, and like being, you know, like, don't, don't yell at him, it was probably an honest mistake, but like I get being frustrated because you asked for some something specific, you paid for something specific, and then you didn't get that specific thing. But I don't think that makes I, I don't think it's very useful to do that when it comes to movies and music and you know paintings and drawings and such. You know, um, yeah, I just I, I, I find it very frustrating. I I think it's fine to describe it, but don't like downvote it and like rant about it if it just if you just didn't like it. If you weren't if you were unhappy with what you got based on expectations. You know, it wasn't what they thought it would be. There are examples of actually bad movies, including Man of the Hands of Fate, The Room, Hobgoblins, Movies where it makes sense to give a very low rating, those are actually bad movies. We here in the West have got to get better at not giving low ratings to movies just because we feel like we didn't understand them or that we didn't like the main character. Stuff like that. There are actual bad movies out there, but a lot of people are missing the chance to watch actually good movies because they're getting negative ratings from people who are just annoyed that they didn't personally like it. And so they rate it as if it's actually a badly made movie. Now, I've already talked about the, the special effects some, but I really, like, this really is amazing. Like, there's almost none of the effects work in this movie has actually aged poorly. Like, it's still, you know, and that's the thing. Like, some stuff like animatronics, it really does, it holds up a long time after, you know. And... Let's see. Yeah, I do agree that the things that this movie shows are extreme. I agree that it makes watching the movie not be a pleasant experience, but I disagree that it means that we can't feel things from the movie or that the only thing you can feel is disgust. It's possible for a movie to run into that, whether intentionally or otherwise. No Cronenberg movie I've seen, you know, just like intentionally only disgusts. You know, I have heard that the most recent Crimes of the Future does just try to, to disgust people, but, you know, I haven't watched it. I don't know if it's an accurate statement. So, the... let's see... Right, and this is also, like, I don't know if I would really call this... 
it's not really a horror movie, you know, and, and it is, like, some, you know, some to some people, David Cronenberg means horror. He has made, you know, th is this, this might be one of his, I mean, this, um, this was still a very weird movie, but the, let's see, I think Spider was probably the, yeah, from Spider and onwards, he's kind of phased out the kind of science fiction and fantasy elements of his earlier work. You know, there's still some extreme shocking content sometimes, but it's not really horror. And yeah, uh, I it's, like I mentioned, I have not watched everything he's made. I, th I feel like I've heard that a couple of his other movies, oh, and older movies, are also drama. But yeah, you know, this is th there are some some things in this that you will likely be disgusted by, but it's not a horror movie. This you know, it's not Videodrome or The Fly. Let's see. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, Scanners. Is almost more of a thriller than a horror, but but yeah. Um, let's see. But yeah, it's definitely not a movie that's made for people who are uncomfortable with uh, just, you know stuff like uh, homosexuality, and you know it also has. Yeah, I already mentioned that the the protagonist is an exterminator so yeah it features some some bugs and let's see. so yeah um i have a i do have this on dvd but it is a very uh, bare it is a very bare version there's just the the trailer that's just under a minute and a half that's the only now, yeah, uh, I rate this seven gutsy adaptations out of ten. I mean, I'm not sure I'm gonna watch this again, like, today. It might be at least a week, maybe more. Um, not because, you know, because it is shocking, not because it is bad. And... Yeah, I do definitely think the movie holds up. Like, I think if I watch this today for the first time, instead of late 90s, early 2000s, I would also really, really love it. And, yeah, um, I, I don't know how many people, you know, like, you know, William S. Burroughs has been very influential, but I actually don't know if you know you know not not every figure that's been influential in lgbtq uh, you know circles is equally beloved by the lgbt community so i don't i don't know um and and certainly you know if you're worried about homophobia like i would completely understand someone for not watching it with how much hate there is these days like if you if you are a member of the LGBTQ community and you just want to sit down and and watch something that will take you away from that or at least like you know it it is ultimately it is made by a straight man you know the it it is you know Dave Cronenberg loves William S. Burroughs' work but he himself is not gay and and the you know any idea of internalized homophobia is going to be a second hand kind of thing you know now yes so this let's see yeah i will i will real quick um so my my ranking of every David Cronenberg movie that I've watched, keeping in mind I love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. The Brood, Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Scanners, Spider, History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Existence, Videodrome, and The Fly. 
And that brings us into the spoiler section. So from here on out, I will be spoiling the movie and the book. So if you haven't already watched the movie, it, I'm also not entirely sure how much it's necessarily going to make sense. They're based on the idea that you have watched. So, starting with notes taken while watching. So, yeah, you have the, the paranoia. You know, he, uh, William imagines himself a spy, imagines his wife is evil, not even human, which, you know, there is, like, if you're, if you're a gay man being forced to pretend to be straight, yeah, you know, some, some gay men end up hating women because of this. And, you know, that's not, a, you know, that's not gay men's fault. It's the fault of patriarchy. The, the, you know, this idea that you, that, that every, everybody has to be straight and everybody has to pair off and procreate. And, you know, the, there are, Let's see. Yeah, both the the fir first it's the the bug in the in the you know they're like I think we got a bug somewhere around here and they put it down and leave the room and then he's like can you rub some of the powder on my does I forget does he say mouth or does he say hole I forget and you know later ah uh, crap I forget it's one of the Jones but now I don't remember if it's Lee or Frost, but, but, you know, one of them also says, could you rub some of the powder on my mouth? Something like that, you know. And, you know, I'm not the first person to point out the, the whole of the, the bug, you know, ah, hold on. Yeah, I think they just call it bug. I'm not talking about the mugwump, but the, yeah, the, the other uh, typewriter bug, yeah, the whole looks like an anus. And I'm not going to get too gross or creepy about it, I swear, but I will just, you know, briefly note. I actually, I don't know if, are there drugs that you take anally? I, I don't know about that, but certainly the idea of a, of a finger combined with an anus, you know, that can be very pleasurable for gay men and also you know others but so so you know obviously it is and and because he has this internalized homophobia instead of just another man being in there it looks like this gross bug you know he he feels an urge towards you know the the male anus but because he had, you know, he has this internalized homophobia, he feels like it's wrong, so he has hallucinates it as, you know, is it a cockroach? It's certainly a, a an insect, you know, so so something harmful to humans, something unnatural, you know, which, you know, that that is the kind of thing, you know, those are some of the things that homophobes say when they attack homosexuality. It's dangerous, it's unnatural, these kinds of... Which is, of course, completely incorrect. Which you will find if you just look at the... Um, what's it called? You know... Yeah, like I mentioned, you know, they're not any... They're much less likely to sexually assault or rape than straight men are. And it's not dangerous. I realized there was a, a myth for a while of, you know, that anal sex would eventually destroy the, you know, and, and apparently, like, that has happened for some, but um, as far as I understand, that was more, and that, that wasn't an issue of they indulged in this as much as it was an issue of, like, not enough lubrication and, and maybe, you know, going going too far too fast, that kind of thing. Which again, that's also a problem with straight sex, you know, so, yeah. Let's see, and... 
yeah, uh, I forgot, ah, crap, I think it, I think it's one of the, the bug typewriters that says the line, like an agent who believes his cover, which is legitimately just a, a great little, because, because it is, like, basically, you know, that is one of the situations that Bill finds himself stuck in, he is, like, or, or I actually, I suppose, is it almost more the the opposite? I guess it, actually, yeah. In reality, there is no, you know, he's he's not in interzone. He's just in another part of New York. He's imagining all these things, and he he tells him, you know, the the hallucinations tell him, I am an agent. I have a cover. I have an assign assignment. When in reality, he is just, you know. He locked himself in a room writing all this stuff that ends up becoming the, the book, Naked Lunch. And, yeah. Let's see. And, and I, I like that on more than one occasion early on, you know, uh, another character says to Billy, why else would you, and then he describes what he just did, you know, like, why did you come to this dive bar? If not that you're on a mission, why is one of them maybe that he shot his wife? Why else? If you if it wasn't that she was a secret agent, you know, a, a foreign agent, you know, these these things of, you know, the the, um, uh, um, you know, he's justifying his his paranoia. And and in reality, these are random actions, and a lot of drug users experience, you know, find themselves trying to rationalize that what they're doing has a very specific purpose you know it, it's um, the 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 human mind does not like the idea of just wasted time like people will usually like and, and again sometimes it's true but you know sometimes people who use a lot of drugs will say it makes me more creative or you know, it's it's the only thing that calms me down, which again, sometimes is absolutely true. I'm not saying otherwise, but the we don't like to think, and that's also one of, you know, when you hear people who, you know, who try to um, de uh, deter people from drugs, one of the things they will say is, you are wasting time, you know, and yeah, it's, it's very, it's a, it's a, it provokes anxiety to imagine that you're wasting time. And yeah, you know, he he thinks he's showing the other writer the ticket, but in reality it's this it's a it's the drug. Let's see. And when the when he buys the, the typewriter, you know, the typewriter is taken out of the window and it's replaced with a statue of a man being raped by a mugwump, which is again, of course, this, you know, he's he's imagining, you know, that actually, yeah, a, a lot of the time when he imagines homosexuality, it comes out looking like, you know, a, a bug typewriter, uh, a mugwump, maybe, you know, there's that time where like it looks like, it basically look like, looks like the the back of a naked man, you know. But it has like a an insectoid tail, kind of. You know, he's yeah. He imagines that it's not that it's inhuman, that it's legitimately completely removed from humanity, which again is one of the the harmful lies spread about homosexuality. And let's see. Yeah, and you know, yeah, everywhere Bill goes, he's out of control. People, sometimes people he knows, but a bunch of the time it's, you know, people he doesn't know. But the first time he meets someone as such. And yeah, they tell him what to do, and sometimes. It's dangerous, sometimes it's not, and sometimes he doesn't do it, but, you know, it's, it's, he feels like a passenger for a, a good chunk of it, which again, you know, if, if you're, if you're on drugs, 
you know, some people become extremely productive, which ultimately is also what we see. He just didn't realize he was being productive. Some people become unproductive. Some people take command, take charge of the situation. Some people go with the flow. Let's see. And, you know, there's the underground meat plant, which, you know, that's where... The, the, yeah, Cronenberg likes to put flesh in his movies. You know, flat flesh being cut or it's in, in, you know, s stuff like that. You know, and, and keep in mind, like, a lot of the, the flesh that we see, like, cut and such in this, that's not, like, real. They, they didn't just go and buy. They, they had to build something that looked like and could be cut open to, to look like flesh. So just, yeah, a lot of effort went into it. And again, that it is this thing of like, on some level, Cronenberg feels very disgusted by these, you know, and it is like meat being, being cut. Like, you know, if you, if you relate it to it as this was once a living thing, like, okay, maybe it didn't have human intelligence, but it, felt things, you know, maybe it understood that it was dying, maybe, you know, maybe it was afraid as it was dying, and, and, yeah, it's, let's see, yeah, and, and, you know, it's a, it's a, the movie exists in this space of this casual relationship with sex, including gay and bi sex and the uh, you know we're told that the frost couple have sex with young boys that you know they invite in so you know yeah both yeah gay and bi like i said and uh yeah drugs and even some violence and and you know sometimes the violence is to the typewriter bugs but occasionally it's to people. And people recognize Bill. They they know you know, they know what he wants to accomplish. And sometimes they're talking to him about something he has no idea about. And let's see. Yeah, a number of the people you know realize, oh, you're an exterminator, or they realize you're an agent, aren't you? And lots and lots of bugs. And yeah, a lot of people who know more than Bill does, people will tell him, try this. And yeah, we, we find out Hank was deported two weeks ago, and it's like, I thought only days had passed, but you know, that's, yeah. He lost track of time because it's a very disorienting movie. And, you know, he, he it seems like everything has some connection to this government conspiracy, these government agents, and, you know, everything is about that. There's nothing that's just random. Everywhere he goes, it eventually leads to either Interzone or the the... US government agents and everyone tempts him and there's this notion of people controlling other people Fadella controlling Joan for example and yeah and and gradually he's introduced to new drugs which is you know that is something that William S. Burroughs himself experienced and that is something that you know, and, th and this can be a positive for some and negative for others, but, you know, if, if you are on drugs for a while, then, you know, eventually you either need to take a very heavy dose for it to still have an effect, or you move on to other drugs. And in, in order to still feel something. And, yeah, you know, every so often we'll see 
t oh, you know, Bill is taking, you know, now he's, now he's injecting something into his, his, um, crap, I forget what it's called, um, on the opposite side of the elbow, if that makes any sense, you know, it's, uh, yeah, you know, he's, he's injecting something, but when we see it, it's evidently not the first time, because we see there's like a bruise there, so he must have injected a lot of times, you know, and there's a time where we see him like, I think it's, it's maybe on the neck or something, he's like putting some powder on his neck, and again, we see like there's some, there's some significant bruises there, so he's done it a lot of times. And, let's see, yeah, and that's, that's right, he's, he's told by one of the, the bug typewriters, he was controlled to kill Joan, and maybe that will make him feel less guilty, and he's told, you know, no, 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 she was an agent, it was a good thing you did, which is, again, you know, it's his, his, his mind, you know, on drugs, trying to figure out what what was that like trying to make sense of you know so so yeah he justified no, no she she was an agent she wasn't human she was evil you know and and that is you know when you look at propaganda like very frequently if a group of people want you know like if you look at military propaganda if the the kinds of you know honestly actually I will, yeah, more, it's more relevant to talk about propaganda against the LGBTQ community. The, the propaganda makes LGBTQ people seem like they're not human, which, again, is, is absolutely ridiculous. You know, I, I've personally not interacted with very many, but, you know, I, Actually, it's possible that I've interacted with more than I think, and some of them just were, you know, closeted, or or it just didn't come up. Like, I don't go around asking people I meet, to, you know, so, what do you do with your genitalia? You know, it's just... But, you know, I, I follow a number of YouTubers, you know, and they seem like wonderful people. Like, just, you know, if, if you look at, like the 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 war the the culture war of of the you know the people who say really hateful things like it tends to be people who are against lgbtq you know the i i'm not sure i've encountered any lgbtq people like i mean you know maybe maybe there are but not like the the a lot of the biggest lgbtq channels here on youtube you know they're they're not looking to you know they're they're not targeting straight cis you know people so it's you know most of the the really the the hatred is coming from people who are against LGBTQ people and yeah they they try to to make them out to be not human to be a threat because that's the kind of thing that you need in order to get people to really turn on because at the end of the day like if you look at another person like i mean what they're they're human right cuz like you know i the the we're we're naturally you know our brains try to recognize you know that's that's why like a number of yeah, you know, when we see another human being, we immediately think, oh, you know, they they might be a member of my tribe. They're they're similar to me. Where you know, if we see, yeah, for example, if you if you can't see anything other than eyes, if you look at eyes and they look feline, for example, you might think, oh, possibly a threat. You know, unless it's a house cat, but you know, a lot of feline, larger felines, are threatening. To, to human beings, so so that kind of thing, you know, you see like the the xenomorph famously does not have eyes. That's not like oh you know couldn't figure out the technology. No, that's by design. If you can't see, you know, you can ever you know you look at the xenomorph, you can tell it's alive, it's moving, it's making noises, it's not dead. But I can't see its eyes. I can't recognize the the you know I can't 
you know, that's so, so, yeah, you know, the, the, um, so, so, yeah, in, in a way, the, this movie is very, like, it's, it's, I guess maybe that is what gay people do look like, gay and, what LGBTQ people look like to really, really homophobic people, like, they look non-human. Now, let's see, the... Yeah, and the, you know, when, if you write subversive material, you know, you, you might feel like a spy, you know, writing can be dangerous. People want to stop you from writing. Let's see. And there's also the, the element that William is addicted to writing. He is addicted to the machine. He, you know, he can't stop writing, and that is, like... I, I wouldn't say I was addicted, but back when I wrote a lot, like, it really is, like, if you've never tried it, um, it can be a really, really positive experience to, to try to, to write something, you know, mo mo today, most of what I write end up in these videos, you know, I, I don't think I was ever that great at writing fiction, but, yeah, I, I, I can't not write but it also isn't the kind of thing like if i needed to to take you know i'm i'm not really i'm not addicted to writing but it would you know yeah i i would be able to to direct it in some other now let's see yeah and and now the yeah we we learned that Doctor, yeah, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Doctor uh, Benway is actually behind it, and it is this thing of like he's essentially going in circles, you know. At, at like early on, he's told Doctor Benway can help with with uh, you know that's how you get off bug powder. That's how you kick the the, the addiction. And then near the end, he finds out no, no, no he's he's behind the whole thing. He's He's doing, he's, he's spreading the addiction. He's not curing it, you know, and actually, yeah, and, and he also says, no, 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 what I gave you, I knew you were going to take it, what I gave you made you addicted, you know, so I, yeah, and that is, you know, that is sadly, you know, that is sadly true. Sometimes when you, you, if, if you, if the person you're trying to get help to, to quit drugs if they're not like legit, they might actually just give you another drug, and that's not gonna kind of that's not necessarily gonna help, at least. And yeah, the the ass ventriloquist bit, like there were a lot of years where I had no idea what let's see, did I end up I think I put um let's see, is it a um, um, maybe not. Um, let's see. I, yeah, um, I, I, I forget exactly who or where, but some. I, I saw someone analyze that basically the the thing with the ass ventriloquist thing is, you know, this thing of, you know, eventually it destroyed this person that his ass was speaking. You know, that's, there, there used to be this myth that, you know, it has now been disproven, sadly there are still some people who believe it, that if you indulge in anal sex, it will eventually, like, uh, can I... I guess I, I mean, I don't have monetization to lose. Um, the, the myth said that it would do, it would eventually do irreparable physical damage, you know, and yeah, it, uh, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to interpret the ass ventriloquist bit as expressing that myth. 
and it is noteworthy that you know, for all the times that William Lee is listening and following other people's lead and such, this is something that he himself offers up. This is a story that he offers up unprompted, and he's saying it to two men who are clearly gay. You know, so it is basically... Yeah, I, I guess it's basically... You know, he's sitting there in Eve's car, and basically he's saying... You can do whatever you want, but I'm not touching that. I'm not going anywhere near that, because here's the kind of thing that, you know, and it's noteworthy that the, and, and actually, the astrontriloquism, that is in the book. Like, I, I'm not even, I, I'm not sure they changed a single word of it. It's just that in the book, the, the um, you know, it's one of many stories, you know, but, but the, yeah. Basically, the, the, um, uh, what's it called? The, um, yes, I think it's noteworthy that the, you know, when the ass starts speaking without him wanting it to, it demands equal rights, which is something that gay men did not have in 1953. So, yeah. And... You know, the, the, yeah. Billiam offers Kiki to Eves for information. And we see, you know, Eves rape Kiki in a cage. And it's penetration of a man's head. And there's blood involved. Which is, of course, what gay sex, you know, that's one of the things... That, you know, again, xenomorph, that's the, the um, oral rape of a man is something that there's a lot of men, there's a lot of straight men, they are way more worried about the idea of oral rape of men than of rape of women, period. You know, that's something that just, the, the idea of not being at the top of the hierarchy and yeah, you know the, the so so the and and yeah, you know in in you know not not in reality, but in in this film, you know, gay sex is temptation, it's transaction, but it's not positive for Bill. It is for others, but yeah, you know that it it is. That that's internalized homophobia of a man who feels desire. You know, he he in his mind he turns it into this ugly, disgusting thing, because how else can he do it? What what are the what do y'all call that in English? Sour grapes, I think. Uh, you know, it's it's this thing of if I can't have it, there must be something wrong with it. Because otherwise, I can't stop thinking about it, you know. And, um, yeah, you know, um, real quick, if you're watching this and you can't really imagine that kind of thing with LGBTQ stuff, well, let's say you're really, really thirsty. And, you know, someone presents a glass of water. If you just think, oh, that's just, that's just clean water, you would want some, you would want, you know, to, to quench your thirst. But, if you were certain you couldn't have that water, you know, maybe you'd start thinking, ah, there's probably, there's probably some germs in that water, maybe it's not so clean, you know, that kind of thing. Let's see, and, yeah, once we get to, you know, the, the, ah, uh, I don't, I guess it's the drug den. Near the end, we see both men and women sucking off mugwumps. And in fact, uh, hold on, his name is Hans. Hans is there. And again, it's this transactional thing, uh, you know, and the, the, yeah, so the, the, yeah, the, the mugwumps, 
Yeah, and, and yeah, near the end they do straight up call it mugwump jism. You know, it yeah, the, when when what you write into the mugwump head is pleasing to the mugwump, the the you know, long thing, the long fleshy things on its head will produce you know, this this white not not quite liquid but substance, you know, that yeah. It's it's not subtle. It's not subtle what it's supposed to be. And yeah, you know, the the idea that uh, gay sex is like an addiction, you know, like basically sexual there is it, it is possible to become there there is such a thing as sex addiction. But the idea that all gay sex is addic you know th that there is an element of addiction that is often born out of uh, again this kind of patriarchal notion that men must only have sex with women if if you're always told that you can't do something it can feel like an addiction you know it it the the longer you put off satisfying a craving the the more intense that craving can become you know which is not to say that all cravings should be satisfied you know if if you're trying to wean yourself off drugs you may have to not satisfy cravings you know but yeah you know because of the internalized miso you know uh, uh, homophobia not misogyny the the yeah because of the internalized homophobia of the the of of William Lee when he sees gay sex it you know it's an addiction it's transactional it's forceful uh, you know the the it it's like it's inhuman it's like a bug all these things and yeah uh, Doctor Benway reveals that he's been in drag as f uh, f what's her name again Fale Fadella and yeah that's it's it's a very and that's also like someone had to make that like they, they didn't have an actual mask that made Scheider's face look like Mercure's uh, obviously that's you know there's just something that can be but Nevertheless, like they had to make a soup for him that looks like just yeah, and 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 that is again, you know, some some homophobes when they see women that have some connection to the the um, LGBTQ community, they assume that they must be men dressed as women. Uh, now let's see. I think that might be. Yeah, and and you know we reach the very ending, and the guards are the, or at least one of them. I think maybe both. You know the guards at Anexia are the played by the same actors as the the. Were they cops or were they feds? It's one of those. You know at the start, the ones who said. You know, we we have a bug in here. We'll we'll leave and see how it how it went. We'll return later and see how it went, or something like that. You know, and you know they they say you know what what's you know the, before they let him in, he's like I'm I'm a writer. Uh, you know, the, look I I got I got a pen. That's that's not good enough. If you're a writer, write something. And, you know, he doesn't say, my typewriter is broken, or, you know, there's, there's so many things that you could imagine he would say at this, but instead, you know, he turns to Jean and says, I think it's time for our William Tell Act. And both of the times that he says that to Jean, she doesn't for one sec, you know, she doesn't stop, like, imagine, imagine if someone that you loved said I want to shoot a glass off your head with a gun you know like that would be terrifying to hear 
but she acts like it's just nothing. You know, she put, puts the glass on her head, he fires the gun, shoots her in the head, and, you know, they say, welcome to Anexia, the, 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 here at the end. And just, yeah, the, the um, ah, what's the word? It's, um, and, you know, it, it seems like no matter what he does, he cannot escape the fact that he has killed Joan. And in real life, William S. Burroughs did accidentally kill one of his female partners during a William Tell act, you know, and yeah, the, the, um, and in fact, he says that he might not have been able to write if that hadn't happened. So the fact that it is connected to writing here, you know, makes a lot of sense. And that is it for this section. So final section, notes taken before watching. Right, so yeah, here we go. IMDb trivia. The shooting of the author's wife is not a fictional incident. Source novelist William S. Burroughs did indeed accidentally shoot his wife Joan in the head in 1951 in Mexico in a William Tell stunt and went disastrously wrong. Mexican law at the time meant that Burroughs only served 13 days in prison for killing his wife. The movie is packed with characters based on real people and events from the life of Burroughs, like Bill... Lee William S. Burroughs was an exterminator and drug addict who accidentally shot his wife during a drunken game of William Tell. Joan Lee is based on Joan Vollmer, dece Burroughs' deceased wife. Hank and Martin, Bill's fellow writers, are Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. Burroughs moved to a section of Tangier, Morocco, known as the International Zone, hence Interzone. Tom Frost is based on Paul Bowles, and Kiki was the name of a young man Burroughs had a same-sex affair with in Tangier while writing Naked Lunch. And some Wikipedia stuff. The film is based on both the works of Burroughs and his biography. Based not on the yeah the screenplay based not only on Burroughs' novel, also on other fiction by him and autobiographical accounts of his life. Cronenberg said it was necessary to throw the book away, as a direct adaptation would have been far too expensive and would be banned in every country in the world. The shooting with Joan Lee. Let's see. Um, right, and after the drunken game of William Tell, he fled to the United States, convicted in absentia of homicides, sentenced to two years, which were suspended. Burroughs stated in the introduction to his book, Q word, that Joan's death was, that's me, the, the, the book is actually called the word, but I am not comfortable saying that word. I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong for LGBTQ people. I, I'm aware that it is being reclaimed. I feel uncomfortable saying it as a cishet. I am forced to the... Uh, right. Joan's death was the starting point of his literary career, saying, I am forced to the appalling conclusion that I would have never become a writer but for Joan's death. And, yeah, you know, part of the movie is, you know, William trying to figure out what happened, why did I kill Joan, you know, and yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like, he kills Joan and then he travels to Interzone and writes Naked Lunch, you know, and then near the end, it seems like he can have Joan back, but if he wants to be led into Anexia, he has to prove he can write, and he can't write without shooting her. Now, some critic reviews. Irrationally, the film makes a lot of sense and its purpose is quite clear. His novel was incredibly controversial, yet in essence the film is about the writing and writers. The gateway to this alternate universe is the typewriter. From there, William receives his missions and apparently writes a stellar novel. Writers live in their own minds. To tell a story, one must delve deep within themselves and find a story worth telling that they could visualize. William's tale, therefore, is real. All of it, every odd encounter, is merely part of the writing process and the path his brain takes in order to spit out his novel this novel of his. These visualizations and alternate reality are merely the, the high given to him by writing and living on the literary edge. Thus, he is addicted to writing, and the high he receives 
from the written word. Ah. I'm starting to lose my voice. I'm going to have to be selective. I don't have a lot else. Let's see. Um, um, hmm. I guess... Let's see the. Yeah, and and one um, user review or possibly professional critic. I know for myself that without constantly writing, I'd be a basket case. Let's see. Unless I write, write, write. And. One person says, as weird as the movie is, it clings too tightly to logic, refusing to ever give itself over to chaos, depravity, or even narrative messiness. And... Yeah, I, I definitely do understand. And, you know, honestly, like, you know, Videodrome doesn't, uh, the, you know say this is what is really happening like after a while videodrome it's you you really can't say what is hallucination what is real you know so i don't know if cronenberg decided against it because that one was a box office failure or maybe he just didn't want to do it again i i don't know let's see and hmm. In Burroughs' book, it is impossible to identify with anyone. Everything is in a blur. There's no clear story chronology. In this respect, the movie is very different. Writers are not lionized, but made dirty glamorous somehow. In his writing, Burroughs is very gay. Peter Weller plays the two masculine. It's weird because he's a scholar of Burroughs. Maybe it's due to pressure. He's cool and calm, not twitchy like Burroughs. Inner Zone should be animated. Burroughs is like the Looney Tunes animators in his writings, too. A lot of the writings, stuff that is right out of a horror movie, and in the movie itself, it's this one monologue, not the rest of the movie. Yeah. Now, let's see. So, yeah, I'm done with critic reviews. Essentially, the only people who could truly understand this book and movie are New York writers who've done drugs, especially heroin, travel to Africa, repress their homosexual urges. I realize some people would say that's that that's an excellent reason not to write the book, not to publish it, not to make the movie. I think it's the exact opposite. I think we are made better by taking in perspectives that are very different from our own. You can say a lot of things about this movie, but it's a perspective very different from the mainstream, and it hits you. It's never boring or predictable. And let's see. See. Yeah, William kills his wife two times at the start and end, book ending the, the movie, and he talks to Ian Holm, who is slowly killing his wife. This is something gay men trapped in straight marriage struggle with, indeed, trapped, let's see, yeah, trapped in, especially back when it was impossible to be gay in public, which thankfully has been more, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, back when I wrote, it's been a while since I wrote some of these notes, and... Yeah, right now in America, it's very, and I think also England, very, very, a lot of hate towards uh, gay and, and trans people. Let's see. Yeah, that is everything. So, yeah. Um, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite Cronenberg movie. Let's see the the yeah um and uh, let's see yeah uh i am willing to discuss my analysis in this especially if it's someone who you know i realize i'm i'm a tourist here i'm i'm not lgbtq myself and if you know, if you are, and you you take issue, and and yeah, honestly, like if I've said something, I've I've tried to be careful to not say something that is uh, offensive to LGBTQ uh, to the community, and uh, to to not say something, you know, painting painting them in a bad light or anything. 
if I have accidentally said something, I'm I'm not you know I I definitely there are definitely things that I'm not aware of. Uh, you know I'm I'm open to you know if you can if you can let me know what it was that I I said wrong I'm I'm open to editing that part out of the video. So if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's a key in a mugwump typewriter. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. They suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of the current... Well, actually, hold on. Yeah, we just ended up... It's... Yeah, right now I'm doing, let's see, weekly I'm doing True Lies and let's see, I'm considering something else, but I haven't, I'm not, just in case, I, I won't promise anything that I haven't, anyway, recently the and Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, in other words, if you're more of this like this, you're in luck, you can check out my back catalogs, let's catch me next week, I hope you enjoyed watching, <clears throat> as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'm gonna go Try to get my voice back, and I will catch you next time.